Hi, and welcome to our very last video lecture. In this course, we've looked at some of the major issues surrounding water in the Western United States, and we've heard from a variety of experts from different fields. We hope this was a useful and broad survey of some of the basics that make the West's hydrology and water management unique and fascinating. Sadly, our tour is ending, even though there would be so much more we could talk about. Many of the topics that we touched on in just 15 minutes or less would actually be worthy of their very own courses. Most of our guest speakers actually devote their entire careers to these topics that we made them cover in a very short amount of time. So there's a tremendous amount of additional detail and nuance to so many of the things that we worked on, and we encourage you to explore these issues further in your own learning. Moreover, there's a, a whole variety of topics that we didn't even get to cover. Many of you gave us some terrific suggestions for future video lectures, including US-Mexico water issues, such as the recent Minute 319 agreement, the Colorado River Delta and its possible future, state water planning, economic aspects of water management, water markets and other frameworks for water transfers, and desalination, just to name a few. Hopefully we can cover some of these topics if we do future versions of this course. Now, however, we'd like to take this opportunity to discuss the future of water in the West. Without a crystal ball, we are reluctant to make predictions of what will happen in the future. Imagine you were living in the West in the late 1800s, if you will. Could you have envisioned the West being home to some of the country's biggest and fastest growing cities, while also dominating some portions of the American agriculture? So in acknowledgement of our inabilities to predict the future, we are instead going to lay out some ideas about future challenges facing water in the West. This will also give us a chance to remind ourselves of the major topics we covered in our broad survey. Remember all the way back to module zero? There we introduced you to the West and we argued that the West's aridity and other characteristics make it a unique and fascinating place to study water issues. We noted the shared characteristics that define this region, like our islands of moisture and our vast open spaces. In light of that, we wonder what aspects of the human geography of the West will evolve in the future. How will dense urban corridors change? Will rapid population growth continue in this region and will it still be concentrated in those urban areas? How will land use change? Will we see more growth in the so-called wildland urban interface and in floodplains? Will the economy continue to shift away from resource extraction and towards amenities and business services? What are the implications for all of these changes for water use? In module one, we talked about the history of water development in the region and some of the defining legal and political frameworks. We learned how early settlers needed to divert water away from where it was available and how that led to the creation of the legal doctrine that's known as prior appropriation. We talked about how states have a primary role in water and use compacts and decrees to resolve their differences. We heard a little bit about the complex issues of Indian water rights, where they fall in the priority system and current water settlement efforts, many of which are controversial. We even heard how the law restricts access to water running across private land in Colorado. In light of all this, let's think about the evolution of water development and management in the West. Perhaps a key question and challenge for the future will be determining what means we can use to ensure adequate water supplies for users. What will the balance be between new supply projects like dams and transbasin diversion and other means like conservation and water transfer? How will we resolve competition among users like cities, agriculture, Indian water rights, and energy production? Module two introduced us to many of the key physical science questions relevant to water in this region. For example, what is the origin of surface water supplies out here? What do we know about groundwater? What causes flash flooding and why is it so much of a concern in certain parts of the West? How can fires, beetle infestations, and dust deposition affect our snowpack and our water supplies? One of the biggest challenges I think that we see in our physical science view of water in the West is how climate change will affect both water supply and water demand moving forward. We know already that temperatures are rising and snowpacks are melting earlier. Where in the West might all of this translate into a reduction in actual water supply availability? How much do we know about the direction and magnitude of these impacts? How uncertain are the future changes and how might we deal with all of that uncertainty? In module three, we focus in on the Colorado River Basin, perhaps the most engineered, dammed, and litigated river in the country. We heard about its fascinating geography, starting in the snowy mountain headwaters and running through incredibly beautiful but very dry deserts. We learned that tremendous variability of stream flow is the characteristic of that river, and that fish species adapted to this variability thrived until major dams were put in place. We heard about the difficult task of creating the Colorado River Compact in the 1920s and how it divided up the waters of the river among seven states using an average flow 
taken during a very wet period. In light of what we know about the basin, we might ask about the future of farming in the Southwest. Colorado River water doesn't just feed cities like Los Angeles, Denver, and Las Vegas. It also goes to farms across a number of states, including the Imperial Valley in Southern California, which grows the majority of the country's winter vegetables. Will these types of farming operations remain viable in a warming future? How will growing demands from cities affect farming operations? Finally, in module four, we covered some of the more interesting, unique, and controversial issues in Western water. Just by itself, fracking could be the subject of an entire course, and the mere mention of the topic often results in incredibly heated and passionate arguments. In the San Francisco Bay Delta, California's north-south water conflicts come to a head, and they're often held up by a very tiny fish. In Las Vegas, massive fountains and huge hotels seem to be a clear demonstration of the West's hubris when it comes to water, but that shining oasis of neon is in some ways a water conservation leader. We know that it's not just cities competing for water supplies, but the energy producers who feed them, and that changing our energy supplies can change our water usage. So what will the next water-related conflicts in the West be? As we face a number of supply-related challenges from climate change, will competing demands result in even more high-octane conflict? Future major controversies could include more instances where endangered species protections go head-to-head -head with big water users. We could see more plans for massive supply projects, or we could even see controversies we can't even imagine yet. Working out reasonable ways to solve existing controversies and quickly diffuse future ones could mean a lot for the future of water in the West. These are just some of the questions and challenges on our minds, but there are obviously so many more. We'll post these in the discussion forum and on Facebook, and we encourage you to add your own suggestions for questions and offer your input on what you think good answers could be. With that, we'd like to offer you our most sincere thanks for being our students. This was not only the first time this course was being offered, this was our first experience with Coursera. We learned a lot along the way, so thanks for being part of our journey. This journey, of course, could have not been possible without the assistance of a huge number of people who participated both on screen and behind the scenes. First, we'd like to acknowledge funding from NASA and NOAA, as well as funding and support from the University of Colorado Boulder, the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Sciences, and the Western Water Assessment. Next, we'd like to thank all of our guest speakers who helped give us a wide range of perspectives on the topic. We asked our guests to condense a tremendous amount of information that they know a lot about into very short lectures, which is not an easy feat. At the University of Colorado Boulder, we'd like to thank the visionary leadership on MOOCs from William Cuskin, Provost Russell Moore, and Mark Werner. A big thanks to our colleagues who chipped in with advice, information, and a lot of patience. Susan Sullivan from Sears Education Outreach, Lisa Dilling, Jeff Lucas, John Burkrain, Betts McNee, Tim Bartsley, and Bill Travis from at Western Water Assessment. We of course need to thank our two incredibly helpful and amazing academic technology consultants without whom this course would not have become a reality, Corey Pavisich and Courtney Fell. All of the cool graphics that you saw at the beginning of each video, along with so many maps and images, are the terrific work of Amy Nakshu Schmidt. Finally, if you thought this course was visually impressive, and we certainly did, then you noticed the handiwork of the incredibly talented Tim Riggs. Tim did virtually all of the filming and video editing for this course, and we are not underestimating when we say this was a lot of work. Tim, you have our most sincere thanks. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us. Please do, please do continue to interact in our learning community on Facebook and Twitter, and stay tuned for more Coursera content from the University of Colorado.